Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I hope you've enjoyed the first day of the Copenhagen Fashion Summit to 2019. I am Akila Joseph. I am a journalist with Al Jazeera International in Washington, DC. Uh, it is my pleasure to join you here today to discuss the complexity of hidden supply uh, chains. Our esteemed panel today, Nina Smith, Julia Ormond, and Anandid Roy Chowdhury, are going to help us understand what are hidden supply chains. Why are they so com complex? Why do they exist and remain hidden? And what can we do to hope that we can protect the basic human rights of workers, many of whom are children? Imagine from now on, don't be scared. Imagine from now on when you see a piece of trim like this. <laughs> when you see beads like this, okay. Some trim for you, some beads for you. Imagine when you see that in a store, hanging from something beautiful, a necklace, a garment, a piece of clothing, that you think of a child. You think of your son, your daughter, your niece, your nephew, a relative. You think of them working in a factory, working in a place where there is a ban for them to go to the bathroom. They're not allowed to go to the bathroom. They're not allowed to stand up. They have to work. 17 hours in a day. Just remember that the next time you see something beautiful like that. So I'm going to ask everyone in the audience, raise your hand if you would knowingly purchase a garment that you know was made by a child or a worker that was forced to do so. I'm checking. I don't see a single hand. Well, that's good. Then I know I'm in the right place. Let's begin. <laughs> Don't you dare. No, I am going to talk about that. <laughs> so, Nina, I'd like to start with you today. You're leading an NGO working to stop labor, to stop child labor in global supply chains. Global supply chains are extremely complex. Explain to us what is a hidden supply chain and what Good Weave International is doing to, to address that issue. Um, well, thank you so much, Akila, and really pleased to be here talking with you all. Um, so hidden supply chain. So a hidden supply chain, it looks differently in different industries, I think in different regions of the world. Um, I'd like to talk about um, home fashion and apparel supply chains in India, where my organization does a lot of work. So um, when we think about a hidden supply chain, we think about... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the work that's happening beyond the factory walls. So there are um, hundreds of thousands of workers in northern India, for example, that are not inside the factory that are working for the glo global fashion supply chain. They are um, receiving orders for work mm -hmm. that originate in a factory, go to a subcontractor, um, might go on to other subcontractors um, that run small production units and ultimately end up um, inside the homes in communities that specialize in things like beading and tassel making. Um, so that's sort of what it looks like. And the reason it's important for us to uh, take those supply chains out of hiding is that um, that's where we see widespread child labor and, and forced labor, as you alluded to. And um, I'll just reference a recent report called uh, Tainted Garments out of um, University of California, Berkeley, which did a study across India um, looking at what's happening in these home-based worker communities that are um, involved in the fashion industry. And um, across the country, there's, I think, a, almost an 18% child labor happening, and um, by Indian law, 99% forced labor. By international law, um, it's 9%. So there's massive problems there. Um, I wanted to describe very briefly, I was just in India in March and um, visited one of these uh, home-based worker communities outside of a, um, a sort of garment-making hub, Secundrabad. 
and um, met with a family. Um, the little girl, Arshi, used to work alongside her parents, and she goes to school now with support from our organization. Um, her, I, we talked quite a bit with her parents, and um, we learned some really interesting things. So they were, uh, the two parents were sitting side by side, stitching a piece of cloth, um, stitching uh, silver sequins onto a piece of cloth, the cloth which was going to go back to the factory to be turned into a jacket. What we learned is that um, the global Europe, the European brand that placed the order um, in a factory was, uh, that order was placed in Jaipur, India. Mm. The order went from the factory uh, to a subcontractor in Secunderabad, which is 360 kilometers away. Um, there, that subcontractor placed an order to, um, to Yusuf, the father of the family, who's a contractor in his village. And they would have placed multiple orders like that. Yusuf keeps some of the work for him and his wife, and then places orders with 20 more uh, women in d various households in the community. So once that, um, that work leaves the factory, it's hidden from view. Um, the workers involved in that production aren't protected under corporate codes of conduct, factory audits, um, and even national law. So very briefly, um, what my organization does to, um, to address this, and, and in particular to fight child labor in these supply chains, is partner up with brands, um, work with them and their suppliers to build um, visibility into the hidden supply chain, and then ensure rights to the workers that are in, in, in that part, in particular focusing on children's rights. We remediate cases of child labor and we implement programs in those communities to ensure children are in school and workers are protected. Thank you, Nina. So I think a good place to sort of take the conversation, as you talk about the challenges that you face, asset, Julia, your organization was the source of transparency in supply chains. You've described TISC as creating a market economy to end slavery and spread human rights. Can you depend on consumers to drive change? Why or why not? So for me, the journey um, towards transparency was to, for us to try and unlock what is it that's blocking us from having information. Um, and, and what we found from journeys around the world where we go and meet with children, I think the, it was really meeting children who were trapped in fishing slavery in Africa mm -hmm. that I met with and I heard their stories, which were all devastating. But it set up this unease in me. And I would ask them as I'd left, is there a possibility that I've bought this fish mm -hmm. and eaten it? And there was, they would always kind of fall silent and there was no way to find out. So for me, when people would say to me, where is this worst in the world? Mm. And Nina does amazing work around the world. But for me, it's in my own home. And the reason I raised my hand mm -hmm. is because I don't think we are there yet mm. to stop doing it. So I know about it and my discomfort is Currently, we don't have, we haven't gotten there yet through transparency to accurate evaluation. So ask yourselves as audience, and this is also into the behavioral economics piece, which I think is really critical. When you, what was the last thing you purchased? And did you ask about how it was made and where it was made? And and I think for most of us, there's so much discomfort in admitting that we're part of this, that we're ashamed of it. So we kind of don't, we, we're not honest about it. And part of transparency, we can't have it both ways as activists. We can't go out there and give the global story that this is everywhere. It's in every country, it's in every supply chain. And tell corporate, if you do not look for it, if you aren't finding it, it's because you're not looking for it. And the, the looking for it is also more about a conversation. It's more about constant interaction. And then when they do do the right thing and go look for it and have the right mechanisms to find it more efficiently, 
to then blame and shame them because they've found more of it. And I think that's a catch-22, that tra the promise of transparency is to allow that level playing field to create trust in an economy and to allow people to open up and admit, yeah, sorry, not there yet. Because not many brands are cutting their CSR department um, just a blank check to go and spend what they think they need to spend. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's another future element of transparency is how much of your profit, what percentage of your profit do you put into sustainability? So that we can actually get a measure on it. And when we, before, when we started the journey around transparency, we started in 2007, um, and the law was passed in September 30th, 2010. September 29th, we had a consumer uh, platform which had generated 67,000 concerned consumer emails to 780 brands, and we'd received 58 responses. This narrative of lack of consumer concern is inaccurate, and it's a bit of a myth. By September 30th, when Transparency and Supply Chains was signed into law by Governor Schwarzenegger, there were 1,000, between 2,000 and 3,000, we weren't completely sure because we weren't had access to that information. 2,000 of the world's top companies were required to disclose in a simple first step what they were doing to eradicate trafficking and slavery and forced labor, which in itself was a human rights impact assessment as well, because we can only eradicate it fully when we spread decent work and human rights throughout the world. I mean, she's pretty much said everything there. I mean, it is a really complex issue. At CNA Foundation, your role gives you a unique opportunity to see firsthand the devastating impact of hidden supply chains. Why do you think philanthropy should be involved? Um, I actually ask it differently. I would say, why not? Why shouldn't it? Because that's really the first thing to do. Um, as philanthropies, not just CNA Foundation, but many others, there are several players now, which is quite heartening. Uh, one of the things that I think that needs a lot of support is the piece on remediation. I mean, as Nina was talking about, it is important to understand that these are not just numbers. They're real lives, real people. And sometimes we don't get to see them simply because we're only looking at the numbers and we feel, you know, someone says 40 million, someone says 10 million, someone says 8 million. Mm -hmm. But even if it is eight, these are eight lives. And like you started, it could be someone of our own. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a big one. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of the remediation, in terms of being able to ensure that communities become resilient so that they do not have to necessarily give up their children into forced labor or child labor, or um, you know, children themselves who are rescued from these exploitative labor conditions can now go back to school, um, you know, have dignified livelihoods, etc. I'll give you a small example. Um, Tirupur um, in Tamil Nadu has the highest number of textile mills um, in the world and in terms of its concentration, and probably uh, the cotton that a lot of us are wearing here is from Tirupur. Girls in these factories are being given birth control pills on a regular basis to make sure that they do not get their periods on time. Because if they have periods, they're going to complain about stomachache, backache, and they will not work. So to make sure that they work for the 16 hours that you were talking about, they are being constantly given birth control pills. And you can imagine the kind of reproductive health care situation that they, they will have in the future. The other piece of work that I think is also very important for philanthropies to, to support is advocacy, simply because, you know, at this point in time, you, um, you know, you could, you could, I mean, look at India. There are so many people, so much to do. Um, the problem, the, the, the magnitude of the problem is so much. So you can actually continuously do remediation, but the problem is going to shift from one place to another. Mm. So what needs to be done is looking at the issue of, um, policy building and policy dialogue, and also enforcing policies that exist. 
I mean, I'll give you, an, give you a very simple example. Government of India currently is focused very heavily on the, on the scheme that it, call, that it calls um, Make in India. So what it, what it says is that, you know, the, the export um, from all other countries in the region should come to India, and India should be one of the leaders in, um, you know, making things in India so that they can be, you know, exported. And, and garments is a big piece because about 11% of... Um, export GDP is from the garment industry. That's humongous, billions of dollars. Not once does the government of India say, make in India responsibly. And that's a big one. Right. We need to hold governments to account in saying, don't just create these opportunities for businesses to flourish, but also make sure that there is human rights due diligence that ensures that the children or men or women who are working there, they thrive. So I think these are a couple of points that I think that you know, philanthropies must focus on and, and focus on the, you know, focus on it from the whole supply chain point of view um, and, and, and kind of do, do the work that they're doing. I don't think there is a single person in this room or that's watching on the live stream that would disagree with any, really any part of what you said. But Nina, how would you respond to the parents of, let's say, an eight-year-old girl or boy that says, my son or daughter has to work in order to help put food on the table. What would you say to a parent like that? Well, we, we actually work with a lot of parents like that. Um, and I think instead of telling them something, we would ask them, <clears throat> why is your children working? What are the barriers for them to go to school? Um, and what you start to learn is that what, um, what Yusuf and Parvina outside of Secondrabad want for their children is the same thing I want for my son. Mm -hmm. They want to feel proud of how they're thriving, about how they might go a little further and have different kinds of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, but they happen to live in a community where the government school literally isn't working and the teachers aren't showing up. And so faced with a decision about having their children work alongside them because they'll make a little more on the piece rate every day, which, by the way, is half of minimum wage in India, what most of those workers are making. Um, there's an incentive to have them there because if they go to school, they're not learning anything. Exactly. So what we ask them is, what is it we can do to make that a positive proposition? We, we work with them um, to get the kids into school and to support them in overcoming those various barriers and work with the local government to strengthen the schools and create accountability um, around what um, the schools are doing alongside the parents in that community. So, Julia, I, I see you getting ready to answer on that. And I wanna, <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to open it up to you. How do you respond to that? Is that the right way to go? I want to resp respond to this because Please. The, the whole thing about me saying, where is it worse? It's in my home. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of philanthropic money and resources that goes to rescue and rehabilitation that's, that's really essential. But our work and what we want to get across to the consumer is what are classified as hotspots around the world because of high numbers of people who are vulnerable. I would say are caused by cold, disconnected choices on the other end of the value chain. There's $150 billion worth of illegal profit in our global supply chains. We, the consumer, the investor, there's a certain group of us who are benefiting while we don't have to see it. The other thing that I want to say about the consumer, um, First of all, we need to deepen our work and we need to have, we need to take a level playing field mm -hmm. and evaluate all of the companies in it. If we only select 500 of them, then that's, if, and one, the last person, the person who gets the least evaluation, and we don't evaluate all of them, it's not fair on the companies who are evaluated and it's not fair on the companies that weren't. Mm. We need to, once we've created this level playing field, have everybody collaborate in the transparency space as well in order to align and scale transparency, in order that policy can align and scale, and in order that practice can. And the consumer, if as a consumer you, like me, feel very challenged in expressing your inner values in your consumer choices, behavioral economics and the the work of Dan Ariely in unpacking our human, uh, our human behavior that's irrational 
is absolutely brilliant and it's really helped me understand we're not doing this because we're evil. We're actually doing it because we're human. Right. We do not deal well with the complex and this is a fantastically complex issue. So our job is to make it super simple for the consumer. So that's the consumer platform that Thank we're working on. Thank you, Julia. So Anand, I'm gonna ask you the last question there. How can brands play a more proactive role in getting involved in 30 seconds? Okay, so uh, I mean, 2019, 21st century to say that we don't know is not good enough. I mean, and that's the first step that we need to take, and not just as consumers, as brands, as suppliers, as everybody. We can't just say, we can't do this because we don't know enough. And, you know, at one level, we're talking about billions of dollars of business, millions of people involved in it, the huge structure in it, tremendous technological evolution over the last 10 years, especially, and then we still don't know if the, you know, piece of clothing that any one of us are wearing is actually made by child labor or not. It's unacceptable. So I think that acknowledgement to start with the fact that our supply chains may have um, child labor in it or may have some kind of problem in it is the first step. And the second is, I mean, I would say you have to invest in transparency. It just doesn't happen naturally. You have to invest into the process. And you can't just say that transparency costs and our, you know, our monies are going down already because that's the least that you have to do. Well, I think our panel agrees that workers, especially children, should not have to endure forced labor conditions or dangerous conditions at all. Julia, in one word, what do you want for workers and children in hidden supply chains? Equality. Equality. Anandit, if the audience remembers only one word you said today, what would it be? Partnership. Partnership. Nina. In one word, how should people get involved? Um, how soon should they get involved? How soon should yes. they get involved? Oh, right now. Right now. Can you repeat, repeat your words? Equality. Partnership. Right now. Can the audience say it with them, please? <laughs> Equality. Partnership. Partnership. Right now. Right now. Thank our panel. <laughs> Thank you.